You are listening to the Famous at Home podcast with Dr. Josh and Christy Straub. Because when it's all said and done, we all want to know that we were famous at home. Welcome back to the Famous at Home podcast. Today we have an incredible mother, grandmother, uh, and and really the thing that I love is she's a Jesus follower, like to the core. And um, we get to learn from her today. So normally we're interviewing people who are in the trenches. We're now interviewing somebody who has done this successfully. Um, it's through the trenches. <laughs> and, and it's through the trenches. Um, Helen Smallbone, thank you so much for joining the Famous at Home podcast. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. So Helen, you wrote a, a book called Be- Behind the Lights is the name of the book. And you talk about um, your incredible journey to raising all of your children. I would love for you to take a moment and introduce yourself, introduce your children um, from your perspective. <laughs> well, um, I've been married for 47 years. So I'm now 67. So getting up there, I don't understand totally why God opened or got me to write a book uh, when I should be retiring and having the time of my life. But anyway, he works in mysterious ways. Um, but uh, we have, David and I have seven children. Uh, we, we had six back in Australia. We lived a fairly normal Christian life back in Australia. Our kids were in Christian schools. Um, yeah, we lived in a nice suburb. We had our home, you know, whatever. Well, uh, my husband has been in Christian music pretty much since since its inception in the late 1970s. And uh, uh, he was a Christian concert promoter. He had a small record company. He managed artists uh, back in Australia. Um, And uh, in 1988, 89, we promoted a tour and lost a quarter of a million dollars, which these days is a lot of money, let alone, you know, 30 years ago it's an awful lot of money um we knew we were not going to trade out of this one and that it was going to mean some major life change he had subsequently two other doors that might have provided a you know a sort of slightly new direction for him those closed and um the only door and opportunity that seemed to open was actually coming to america um and uh, managing an artist here and so with that being the only open door, he came to me and said, are you able to, would you be okay if we go to America for a couple of years? And I said, yeah, just for a couple of years. <laughs> We've been here 30 years since. Um, uh, when we left Australia, um, I was actually pregnant with our youngest daughter. We arrived here and, and most people aren't quite as crazy as us. And, and this journey has been a crazy journey. Most people, if they're going to make a major life change, they'll have a nest egg there. They'll have something put aside. They'll have something fairly secure. Frankly, we had nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, We arrived in Nashville um, to manage this Christian artist. And uh, within two months, David actually lost his job. And uh, so then we were really thrown living by faith. We realised... We really had nothing to go back to. And I'm glad God closed the exit doors Mm. because if he hadn't closed the exit doors, I think we might have just run home, to tell you the honest truth. But we had nothing to go home to. We'd even actually traded in our return tickets. So we would have had to beg, borrow and steal. Our youngest daughter was born a few months after we were here. We had no insurance. It just lets you know sort of the... I mean, the scary place in a way we were in. Um, But sometimes God does that to us and uh, we just have to trust him. And really it was a stripping away of everything that we knew and would rely on to really deepen our relationship with Jesus. And uh, so we, we, we basically lived by faith for the next couple of years. David picked up another job. Um, But when we first arrived, um, yeah, it was like camping out in a rental home because we had no no beds, uh, we had no furniture. I mean, it was pretty bizarre. Wow. So where, so, so are you renting at this time? Like you got six kids, like take us into that. Like you got six kids, you have a brand new baby. And and (laughs) I I know for everybody listening, you know, and and I, it sounds like a movie because you're like, 
you know, I, we just had, so we, we were talking a little bit before we have 10, eight and two, and then even just introducing our two-year-old back into the family, like all the baby stuff, like, and you know, it's like, that was such a foreign world again. And we had to yeah. recreate like a safe place for this baby to live. Yeah. How did you do that? Well, I did bring some, a few basic supplies over from Australia just, and, and we, we were renting. Um, we did get a rental property. Um, and uh, really, the community loved on us. Mm. So people were very aware. We were in a small, you know, suburban community. People, and we looked weird, to tell you the honest truth, because we had so many kids. And so the kids would be out playing and people would drive and we were on the main road. God knew what he was choosing because we were on the main road into the estate. And so everybody would drive around and see all these kids there. And so we got to be known fairly quickly, I think. And then um, some people were aware of us and they they started bringing us groceries and sort of they, they, they saw how we were living and uh, some some actually music industry friends um, took us out to dinner and then they came back. David wanted to introduce them to the kids. So we came back to the house and this was actually before Libby was born and we'd been in, the, in America for about two months. Kids were sleeping on beds made of clothes. Um, I had a mattress being very pregnant. The, the, landlord, the landlord couldn't leave me to sleep on the floor. He said that that just would not be, he couldn't live with himself if he'd done that. So he did leave me a single mattress that was on the floor. Um, and then these friends came in to meet the kids and realised it was an empty house. Mm. And we were really, in our minds, were just thinking, well, this is like camping out in a house. Like, this is sort of fun, you know, like <laughs> um, realising you're not going to be able to do it for too long. But, but for the moment, it was sort of fun. Um, they were playing like, cricket which is like baseball in the living room and I mean it was you could just run amok because there was nothing there to trip over or do anything with well when they saw that we did not have any furniture and uh, they went back to their Sunday school class of the local church and then they called in one night and they walked through the house like these six people just walked through the house they figured out what our needs were and then they went and empowered their um, Sunday school class, came back with two box trucks and just filled our home. Yeah. Um, I was extremely thankful because up until that time, I had been hand washing our clothes. Um, after the kids would get out of the bath, I would throw all the clothes in the bath um, and uh, I would I would uh, leave them in there overnight and then in the morning I'd wash them and then we'd put strung a line outside and, we would hang them outside. But once you start getting into, you know, November, it starts to get cold and nothing dries outside. So then we got a, um, you know, just an inside uh, laundry stand and we'd put, them over, put that over the air conditioning vent and they would dry like that. But I knew, and that most of the warm clothes were what the kids were lying on. Um, this is before we got the furniture and I knew we weren't going to be able to maintain this. So when they brought this, um, these box loads full of furniture to our house, two of the things there, one was a washing machine and another was a dryer, yeah. that I reckon lasted us for over 10 years. I mean, they lasted for a long time. And I don't think I've ever been so thankful to see a washing machine and a dryer as, oh, wow. as that particular time. Oh with my seven goodness. seven children. Like yeah. I and I'd love to just like when you guys came, was there any vision or plans for like we want to was it mostly just for David or what did you have plans for the kids? Did you even see a vision for that? Well, that's an interesting question, Christy, because um when we arrived here in 1991, Rebecca was 14. Um and she had been in a Christian school and she was actually noticed by one of the music teachers in, in the Christian school. And I probably do need to say three of our four, our seven kids, one is Rebecca St. James and she's the oldest. And then we do have um, Joel and Luke Smallbone who are in for King and Country. 
as number, he, well, Joel's the middle child because he always tells everybody. So he's number four and number five. <laughs> and, uh, and so Rebecca had been noticed by the music teacher at school um, as being a very good singer. And he was using her, he was a songwriter, and so he was using her to demo some of his songs. And then she did try out for what they call an outreach rock band uh, before we left uh, Australia. And she got into that rock band. And it was really more for senior students. And, I mean, she was in grade eight, I think. So it really wasn't, for them to have even included her was a bit unusual. So that sort of twigged our attention that somebody outside just David and me was recognising that she was gifted. Mm -hmm. um, and then she had the opportunity because we were still touring, there's a bit of a story to it, but she had the opportunity of opening for Carmen in Australia on his tour. And it was sort of a test because having been around music and artists all our life, we know that it can actually go to your head and mess with you and whatever else. And so it was a test to see whether she could handle mm. being in that sort of environment. And as she walked in the door after five concerts around Australia, she walked in the door and she said, oh, she's so nice to be home. I just want to clean the house. I was like, yeah, I think she might be able to handle it. You know how <laughs> to handle it. She's going to be good. She's got it. She's going to be okay. Yeah. So then um, before we left Australia, uh, we did record a praise and worship because praise and worship really started in Australia mm. before it came here. And uh, we had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early 70s and it really grew out of that. And so um, when she recorded a, 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 an album of praise and worship, Australian praise and worship, and we brought it back here, um, well, we brought it over here. So, yes, there was a sort of plan that maybe uh, there was a career future for Rebecca in Christian music. But just Rebecca? Just Rebecca. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you tell the story in the book, which I love, uh, just how Joel and, and Luke got started, which we can, you know, move to that <laughs> here in a little bit, because I, I love that, the, the interaction there. And and for those of you listening, like this is an opportunity for you, we'll put this in the show notes. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to put this down here for you to please go get behind the lights. It is such a delight just to, I love entering into story. Yeah. I love entering mm -hmm. into seeing the behind the scenes. The book is called Behind the Lights, but the behind the scenes, it really is. And, and, you know, uh, you know, Joel and Luke put together a song for you in Mother's Day called Unsung Hero. And I just think for, for those of moms that are listening right now, like, th who are in the trenches, and it feels like you're, you're not seen. Um, I hope this conversation encourages you, as you hear Helen, just tell the behind the scenes stories and just the faithfulness of God for just to stay the course and stay the course because you are seen. And I think Helen is a great example of this. And so um, I want to come back because uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit. I, I, we'll try to build this up chronologically. At least that's how I'm thinking of it in my head. But, you know, going back into those early years, I know you guys, uh, you talk in the book about your journey to homeschooling as well. And I know we've got, um, families who are listening who who are homeschoolers and then we got some who their, their kids go to public school and, and private Christian school or wherever that looks like but I'd love you know we're kind of in that unconventional uh journey ourselves of homeschooling and and what that looks like I know you guys took that unconventional route speak to that journey if you wouldn't mind of how because I know that that was it was really weird for you you talk about in the book like to, mm -hmm. to go to that journey mm -hmm. could you talk about that Mm -hmm. Well, when we were in Australia, we had some very good friends who also had seven children. It's unusual for, even in Australia, for families to be that big. And we would hang out a lot. And he was very countercultural all his life. He's a musician, all his life's been countercultural. And so he had actually had the opportunity of managing a school, a very small school of kids that nobody wanted to have anything to do with. And he took his, ki his kids out of school and he managed this sort of schooling setting. And he came to me afterwards and he said, I've realised school's not all it's cracked up to be. You know, the, the, the amount of education that they actually get done on a day-by-day -day basis is minimal. And he said, when I took my girls out of school, 
and we started doing life together, I just noticed huge changes in them. I mean, huge changes in them. So fast forward, to, so we, every time, because he was so countercultural, he was so interesting in the way he thought, he did impact me. I'm not sure he impacted David on this particular subject, but he did impact <laughs> me. And so um, in 1991, we thought we were coming to America in March or April of that year. And our school system starts in the end of January, beginning of February, uh, because that's the end of summer and, and that's when we start. And so I went to David and I said, listen, we have no money. We've got our kids in a Christian school, which has been great. But, I mean, it's really not fair to put our kids in the school. They're going to be there for all of two months. And then some poor other kids going to have to take their place in a classroom two months after the school year started. And I said, what do you think about the idea of taking them out of school? And I homeschool them, a bit like what Rod suggested. And David looked at me and said, well, I'll drive you crazy. And I said, well, more the better to know that now. Like if they drive you crazy, we're only got two or three months and then we'll, you know, we know. Well, I took them out and it was really fascinating to me because we're about two years down between each, I think, Rebecca and Daniel, who are our first two oldest, there's two years apart. We have three years between number five and number six because I was getting tired by then. So, you know, it was <laughs> had, had a little bit more of a break. Um, and uh, so anyway, so you can just imagine if Rebecca's 14, you can do the math and just go down. Well, when we brought them out of school, Daniel, the next boy down, was 12, and he was like, I mean, what am I going to do? I've got nobody to play with. And I'm like, well, you've got your brothers. I mean, we, we, we're booking girls and five boys in the middle. I said, you've got your brothers. It's like, well, how do they play anything? Well, when desperation comes, you learn the art of creativity. So then he decided that they would play cricket in the backyard and he would use his brothers and he would modify the rules according to the age. And I just noticed this family cohesion and actually liking one another and enjoying one another and creativity and modification of how they're going to do things. And I loved it. I loved being with, I suppose you don't have a large family if you don't like kids to start with, but I just loved <laughs> being in that environment and having me there, uh, having them with me. Yeah. So anyway, our time for departure to from Australia get kept putting back. We didn't leave Australia till the third week in August. By the time we got settled into Nashville, it was like, I think, when we got into our house, I think it was the 17th of September. And so we're in the same scenario, like schools have started, we're all under culture shock, we're still reeling from not, not really having our lives together in a way, just taking the next step. And I said to David, I can't, I've got to have the kids. I, I can't, I can't do this without, unless we're all together. I just, I rely on them too much and I can't do it without them. And I said, what about we homeschool for the first year? And through that season, the kids actually started physically working. So Rebecca was babysitting, cleaning houses. We were raking lawns that first fall and we were doing it together. And it really taught us all how, what one, what a workforce we can be. If everybody plays their part, you can be a major workforce. I don't not care if you're six years old. It's amazing what you can do as a six-year-old, you know. Um, so we became a, a workforce, very practical, working together, doing gardening. Um, we ended up taking the boys to help cleaning because... It was, houses were just too big, even for, well, I mean, I felt guilty for Rebecca, so then I started going with them, and then it was really too much for just the two of us, and so then we would take one of the boys to do the grunge work of vacuuming and mopping floors, and and so we, God used that time to teach us to work together, which the five boys are still working together today. Amazing. So cool. Yeah, that's so cool, and it's wow. so, it's so neat to see, like, uh, well, even to see the work that they're doing together, you know, today and how that has, you know, the foundation of that. And I think that's the hope that you are providing all of us is mm -hmm. that 
Yes, it, th there's so many days because you know the the just the phrase the days are long and the years are short. It's uh, uh you know it's like the days feel so long when we're doing this homeschooling thing or we're taking care of our kids or raising our kids and and we're wondering are we getting anywhere? But you're fruit of that. That when we put this all together. And and I love the resourcefulness that you taught the kids. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's the thing I'd love to, just for you to encourage those listening right now, how to, are there some practical ways that you would say, hey, this is what we found, or this is what I would encourage you, this is what worked, this is what didn't work, in terms of pushing resourcefulness and that family cohesion together? I think... Um... Well, in terms of family cohesion, because, I mean, sibling rivalry is real. I mean, you oh. know, it's real. Um, in terms of family cohesion, basically if the kids didn't get on, I would actually make them do more together. A bit like so, three-legged race, time together, you've got to work it out. I mean, you've got to cooperate with one. You've got to work it out. I, or making them play a board game together until they had right attitudes. I was huge huge on attitude I, I have this statement that says attitude comes before action you nail the attitude and the actions will follow you let the attitude build then the resentment and the falling out in terms of actions will follow because that's the fruit of the attitude so I was big on attitude so family cohesion was there I think when we look at our culture the western culture it has very low expectations of children. Yeah. Mm, it's good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. If you look at more tribal cultures, more poor, poor cultures, everybody has to play their part. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember, we were poor. We were broken. We were poor. Everybody had to play their part. And then I noticed um, the fruit of that, you know, of, well, I can do something. I can make a difference. Like, I mean, at 10, I can, I can contribute. Um, and it was an interesting scenario because even the three, you know, Josh, and when Libby was born and she was young and we were doing a lot of this hands-on work, Josh at three, while we were out mowing lawns and doing gardening, he would be pushing Libby around in a, in a stroller. So everybody had their place. I mean, we were all there together. And, if, and Luke... You know, you guys know Luke personally, but he's a pretty good talker. And yeah. so it wasn't <laughs> uncommon for Luke to chat up the actual person, place we're at. And I, I mean, after a while, and you realise when you're missing that labour, it was like, Luke, just get yourself out here and start actually doing something. You know, and so... <laughs> I loved reading that part of the book. I loved that part. You, you, yeah. you found him sitting up with his feet up yeah, on, a, on a tractor. I was doing right on tractor. And I'm like, Luke, what on earth are you doing? I mean, you can drag these leaves just as well as anybody else. Get down here and start working again. So, you know, moving on from that to God, through that basic time when we were poor, when we had nothing, we learned to rely on each other. We learn to work together. We learn to be together. A lot of that takes a lot of just being together, it takes a lot of rough edges being knocked off because we, we can tick each other off pretty quickly. And, and we've got a lot of leadership personalities, which even means more you've got to be more modifying who you are and what you're going to say. Um, then when Rebecca started, she got signed a development deal uh, about 15 her first album, God, came out when she was 16. David did go off with Rebecca and do some stuff, um, but we realised fairly early on that we did not wish to be separated. Mm -hmm. So we actually then decided that when touring came that we would tour all together and that the boys would be her crew. And really, that's where they learnt the skills that they've, they've, they're using now. I mean, they say it takes 10,000 hours to really hone the skills of whatever you're doing. Those boys got their 10,000 hours probably before they were 20. You know what I mean? Like they were learning those skills from very young ages. And they got, and I, I liken our family a little bit like a farmer's family where you learn from the ground up yeah. how to do it all. 
and then you grow up you can make the choice well do I want to be a farmer or not and really that's what we did except we were um, a touring and musical family where well we're not musical in terms of being like musicians but but we were a touring concert family and the boys all learned the skills of how to put on a concert what it entailed from merchandising right through to lights to sound to stage design they learned it all and uh and so they've they've, they've done their ten thousand hours and and it really got us used that um to really benefit them i had a scenario homeschooling is very interesting, particularly when you're living alternatively. Because, and we were counterculture, we took, our kids weren't in school, none of our children have been to college. Rebecca hasn't even finished high school. And yet, I think she's written 10, she's had 10 CDs, written 12 books. Like, what the culture tells us okay. we have to do yeah. to be successful yeah. is actually lies, to tell yeah. you the honest truth. Now, yeah. okay, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to have to follow a conventional yeah. route. Yeah. But there's so many jobs that apprenticeship used to be how we all learnt our skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And really, I suppose, we've modelled, we've moulded in apprenticeship into our lives. And the kids learned those skills from a very young age. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I think, you know, for me too, I, I say this and, you know, I have a PhD, so I can, you know, I feel like I, I say this to our kids. Um, well, our kids aren't old enough yet to really understand the concept of college, but like, I'm not pushing my kids to go to college. Like I'm pushing my kids. I, I want them to learn. They both have their own businesses that they just started in the past year, That's you know, eight and they're 10. And yeah. I want to teach them things that I never learned uh, even having a PhD, they never taught me in school, you know, because I, yeah, there's just the conventional, like you guys are at a great example of this, of doing this in a non-conventional way, because I, I think you're right. It's, it, it's lies. Like it is, yeah. you don't need to be doing this. Um, well, and sometimes it is a benefit, but it's not, if, but the thing that I feel I want, I want each of us as Jesus followers to one, be actually a follower of Jesus. Yeah. Go where he leads, Good. not take him on my journey. Wow. Do you know what, you know, follow where he leads. Wow. God, are you in this? Are you wanting this? Praying that for your children. Who did every child, every child is born intentionally with a purpose, with a calling. So as parents, to me, it's, it's finding out, well, who are you? What is your skill? Why did God create you? What is your calling? What has God got you on this planet for? And it's called a vocation. Then. It's actually following what God has called you to do. And that changes things. I hear so many parents that say, well, they've got to go to college because they've got to get a job that's going to pay them well. Is that, is that what God monitors as success? No. I, I, I don't think it is. I think we've got to be the priority in our lives in, as Christian parents is to understand who that child is, yeah. what he was created to do, giving the skills and the um, strength of character mm -hmm. and relationship with Jesus to be able to follow who God's created him to be. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, I don't know, you've, yeah. pretty much nailed it uh, whatever that might look like oh. and it might not look like what you had a plan for yeah and I think that's what Helen I, I'm listening to you talk and the things I'm picking up so much are I mean, even the humility like the humility in you and in David but then also in your kids that you a modeled for them but b then taught them to pick up a rake and clean houses like that this isn't it's not beneath you. This is like, this is just what we do. And we serve our sister who's on tour by loading up, like loading in and loading out and like the humility of that, which I think, you know, we have it's this, the foundation. It's the foundation. Like we have this organization called famous at home. And the reason is that we, we serve a lot of people who are very well known on their stages, but when the strength of your character is not big enough to sustain this, you know, the right. your or your relationship with Jesus or your dependence upon him. Yes. 
Yeah. You yeah. know, because pride, particularly when you're yes. well-known, yes. particularly when you're on a stage, as a Christian, and it's probably one of my most uncomfortable as a mum of mm. three people who are, who are on the stage a lot and more who are well-known, um, my biggest fear is that at some point on that journey they're going to start to think how good they are. Because pride is the beginning of all falls, like sin. I mean, and, and we're all susceptible. So we've all got to be watching. But to be a Christian and to be on the stage, I don't care whether you're a pastor, an evangelist, um, a singer, a musician, when you're on the stage and people are looking up to you, one, there's a responsibility as a Christian to continue to be God on them. But two, there is a, we've got to keep our focus on Jesus or else we're going to start thinking, well, gosh, I'm pretty good. Like these people really like me. Like I'm, yeah. And take the applause for ourselves and that will destroy you. And the thing that breaks my heart is it not just destroys you as an individual, but it destroys the, the, the message of who Jesus is because people look at you as a fallen person, whatever it might be, and then they blame God. See, God, you know, these Jesus people, these Christians, uh, you know, yes. they are yeah. And that breaks my heart. So I suppose my part of my, I feel my role is to, to continue to love on those who are in these priority positions and just make helping them to see Jesus on their journey. And that's the case for every one of us. I don't care if you're a mum, if you're a gardener, if you're a doctor, you've got to see Jesus. I mean, you've got to look for his hand Every day, what is he doing in my life? What is he wanting me to do in my life? What is he wanting me to speak? How is he wanting me to encourage these other people? How is he wanting me to love? And, and if you're looking for Jesus in your life, you will see him. Mm. Mm. I just think that's, you know, speaking of that, I'm going to uh, invite all of us in on a conversation I actually had with Luke because it was an interaction that you that he had with you that kind of he said uh you know he was telling me I had a conversation with him um prior to our talking to you just he was just telling me stories about you and growing up and he said you know one of the insights was it was it was kind of like these golden moments these golden nuggets where there was just conversation mm -hmm. that that shifted who he was how he saw something because you were pointing him to his calling and there was one in particular where he was uh, invited to go, I think, lead worship. And and he didn't want to go do it or he wasn't feeling. And I can't remember the exact details of the story, but he wasn't wanting to go do it. And and he it, it was a very, it was one of the pivotal conversations he said that he remembers ever having with you where you sat down with him and, and you asked him basically, what does Jesus want you to do? Is, is this what God is calling you to do? Because if it is, you're not going to know unless you go do it. And he said, that's when he said yes, because of the conversation that he had with you. And, and for me, I think it's really powerful to speak to those listening, like the words that we speak as parents to our kids hold so much weight for Luke to hear that from you back then. And for him to tell me that today, now himself as a dad, you know, and, and as a successful musician, that pivotal conversation that he, that holds so much weight for him today, but it was because you pointed him to what what's Jesus calling you to so it's everything you're talking about and yet I'm having this conversation with him that he is you know completely separate from this that he remembers that as a pivotal moment in his life yeah. if you could just yeah just speak to that because I think for parents listening to realize the words we use in pointing our kids to Jesus hold so much weight and I I'm, I'm glad that you use the actual term God moment because I also have a big um, belief that as parents, we've got to have God moments with our kids. Mm. And it's turning. So, and I'll give you an example of one. Um, our eldest son, one, when he would have been around 10, came home and it was after school. So he was tired, whatever. I, we got into an argument no idea what for about like it's amazing how we can remember the incidents but we have no idea what caused it yeah. he stormed off and slammed his door by that point i'm angry i mean i'm i'm now i've hit it too 
I did take a few minutes to just calm because I don't think we should ever discipline in anger. Because mm-hmm. when you get to that point, then you can lose control and we should always be in Good. control. So I calmed myself down and I went down and I said, don't you ever do that to me again. You will not slam doors in my face. I, and this, people who might criticise me for this, but I said, I know you don't particularly like me at the moment. And I said, frankly, I probably don't really like you at the moment either. Why you just that? That's where people probably aren't going to, anyway. But I said, I love you and I know you love me. And love is a whole different emotion than like. And we're going to action on the love, not the like. Come and give me a hug. Mm. You know, stood there defiant for a minute. And he was like, and I said, come and give me a hug. And he did. He burst into tears. Mm. I burst into tears. Mm. We hugged one another, acted on the love, and then we prayed together. And that bonded us in a deep way. Those are God moments with our kids. We have to fall. And that's one thing that concerns me about when we're too busy to create God moments. We don't have enough emotional bandwidth Mm -hmm. to create God moments. We we lose a special thing. That, that, That moment will never come back again. That teaching moment. Yeah. will never come back. Those biblical principles of reconciliation and forgiveness and acting on love, even when I'm ticked at you, I'm angry at you, those God moments change us. Resolved conflict leads to intimacy. And when you resolve a conflict like that with your child, it takes your relationship to a whole other level. And I, I distinctly remember the fruit of that God moment with him. Wow. Man, that is so good. I just think it's such an encouragement for all of us who, yeah, we're in the trenches. We feel like we're messing up, you know, and, you know, it, it feels like how in the world am I going to get, you know, my kid, it, it, all of what's so encouraging is that, you know, like I said earlier, we, we get lost in the day to day and we feel unseen. And what's happening here is you're showing us like, you know, we're not going to always get it right. There's going to be moments. No, you're not gonna always get it and it's like, no, but God is in the middle of even that to make it right for that's us. It. That's it. And, and that's somehow cultivating something in the hearts of our kids. Yeah, that's it. You've, you've really got to, you, you know, got to go beyond, I don't know, sometimes even the circumstances to go deeper. Mm-hmm. If, if a child is really upset with you as parent, You've got to ask why. I mean, why are we always at, you know, butting heads all the time? What is it here? Are they jealous of somebody else? Are they, is there stress at school? Mm -hmm. Um, Are they feeling insecure with who they are? You've got to go deeper. Mm -hmm. And frankly, as parents, and we're talking about another individual, we can't get in their heads. We we often, the answer's like, well, I don't know. I just know that they're not very happy at the moment. Well, that's when you go to God. Because he does know that other individual. And you hone your skills to going to God in prayer and listening and understanding. Help me understand here. What is going on? And I had that situation with our youngest daughter. So most of our kids, and particularly the ones who walked through these hard days with us, which would be, you know, Josh, who was the the, the youngest boy, probably upwards, but but you Probably Luke, Joel, you know, those older four or five, maybe they, they, they understood more of what was going on. But Libby didn't have any of those experiences. And for whatever reason, God only knows, she, most of them were reasonably spiritual. So we'd say, you know, we need to pray about this. And they would take it seriously. Libby came along and she was like, we need to pray about that. And she'd sit there and go, oh. You know, a whole body language, I mean, the sign, the roll of the eyes. I, this is, I'm talking preschool, like just the whole, oh, do we have to do this again? I mean, <laughs> and like, I just got to a point where I'm like, I can't get inside this kid's head. Like, I have no idea where this comes from. I mean, we've modeled living out our relationship yeah. with Jesus since she was born. Like, where is this coming from? 
So I went to God and I said, God, tell me what's going on here because I just don't get why she is so anti who you, like, you are. And, and any time there's a spiritual moment, she just doesn't want to be there, doesn't want to be there. And as she got a bit older, she'd get up and leave. I mean, she'd just be like, oh, well, I'm out of here. You guys are going to get all spiritual, I'm gone. Well, and it really concerned me because I'm very aware of those younger ages are so pivotal as to someone's walk with God, you know. And I'm unusually, most little kids are more open to a concept of God. It's as they get older that they're like, yeah, I think there are other things out, you know, out there that I, I, I might believe more than this. But so I went to Jesus and I said, you're going to have to give me something to go on here because I'm so discouraged. I don't know what's going on inside her head, what's inside her heart, but I'm concerned. And he gave me an image, and the image was she's like she is a flower, but like at the moment she's a closed bud. But I'm going to open her up to a beautiful flower. She'll blossom. And I tell you what, after he gave me that picture, whenever she would sit there and be like, oh, do we have to do this? I would say to God, she's yours. She's still in the closed bud stage. Remember you promised you were going to open her up. You were going to create a beautiful flower. I, she's 30 years old now because she's our book mile marker for being in America. She has... <laughs> walked a very, which Josh, you know from the book, a very unique journey, a very different journey to anybody else in our, in our family. But God has used her journey to break her, to open her, mm. to do the hard work of healing, and she is a beautiful flower. She's mm. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what an encouragement for those that listen and uh, and and feel like they you're or you're listening right now and you do have a child who yeah. you you know you're praying for well, diligently. I, know, and, I feel like we all do. Yeah, it's like we all do. and I feel like At different so, stages. Too. Yeah, I was just yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. a five year old who's right there, and then you'll have an eight year old, and you're like, "Where's he at? Like, yes. where's he gone?" Yes, yeah. I feel like for even for us, it's just it's just like that, and it switches, and all of a sudden you're very concerned about this child, and that one's actually doing well, and this one is. The concern and I think that just apparently continues but I would I would just love to know like as a as, a, as you know speaking as a mother as as a mother how do we pray for our kids like how did you do this how did you I would say like not just preserve but like persevere for all these years because I can't imagine the amount of pressure that you guys have been under and the scrutiny and the, and also the fear, like you said, of, of pride creeping in, of, you know, maintaining that cohesive bond, especially now that they're working together and the lights are brighter. How do we do that? Well, well, particularly for moms who have younger children or who homeschool, I had to, I, I, I don't know why I understood the principle of self-care. Mm. But as a mum, we have to practice self-care. Mm. Um, so I needed, for me, an hour off a day. I just needed to, and it wasn't an hour to catch up on the laundry or to clear the, you know, it wasn't an hour to work. It was an hour for me. Mm. And that's going to look like different for every single mum. Mm. For me, it was to go to my room and to um, read maybe nap, but I, that would be my devotional time. So if I was in a stress scenario about a child, I would take that in there and say, God, I am really concerned. You're going to have, have to give me some words here or you're going to have to show me what's going on here. And I'll tell you what, um, and, and, and when they had that hour, everybody else knew they had that hour too. So they had to be on their, in their rooms reading, and we didn't have the media option, but it would be no media, reading, playing quietly, or if they're younger, sleeping. So it was sort of, it was universal, you know. And that hour refreshed me so that I had enough to give for the rest of the day. Um, now, is it perfect? No. But one thing that it did um, teach me, teach me that every time 
I went to my room, particularly after you've had a disagreement with somebody, and I'm like, I've got no words. Like, I don't even know what to say to this kid. I have no idea where this is coming from. I don't know what to say. I'd go to my room and I'd sit and say, God, show me. Mm. Tell me what to say because I don't know. I've tried all my, all my to-go-tos, you know, all the things that you go to and you think, and they haven't worked anymore. So what's going on? The number of times he gave me something, either a word or a picture of a different insight that I know I never thought of myself, that would give me breakthrough or give me hope. And hope goes a long way. Yeah. So yes and and so learning to listen and you know be still and know that i'm god if we're so rushed and so busy then we don't hear from him and so he to me a lot of our hard things in life are just because we're not taking the time to really grow and hone praying and listen wow. and hearing his voice Wow. And you know when you know when he's spoken to you, it's that quiet assurance in your spirit yep. that no, that's what I need to do, and that's and that's it. And it yeah, sometimes you might get it wrong still because you haven't heard properly, but it's it really is life changing. And 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 to me, that's what God wants from each one of us. He wants to join us on our journey. He wants to inspire us. He wants to lead us. He wants to fill us. But we've got to be available. And I think sometimes when we don't sense some of that, it's because we're not making ourselves available enough for his spirit to guide us. True. This is... This has been... um, It's been just an encouragement. I I, I think it's an encouragement for me from the standpoint of um, it's so profound, but yet the simplicity the God moments, the, the, the one hour, the um, opportunity to pull your kids in and be resourceful and, and, and show them, you know, how to, how, how to do good work and, and to work as a team and, yeah. and, and sibling rival, the, the, the number of practical. And I hope as you're listening, you're able to take some notes or maybe go back, but even getting your, the sibling rivalry stuff, we hear that a lot. And it's like, get them working together, put them in a three-legged race. Like, Put well, them and, and I, make them I work seriously, together. I really need to ask that question before we close because I. How does that work, Helen? Now with them all working together, like all of those seeds you sowed early mm. on, and you somewhat forced them to work together when they didn't want to, and now they're choosing to. Like, how has that? How have you seen that play out? Well, there still will be some sort of sibling rivalry, and now I mean. We, we're in the age group now of 45 down to 30, which is probably the age group of a lot of you guys out there listening. So hopefully, and I think practically, yes, they're all honing their own life skills now. So, you know, Josh, you mentioned talking to Luke. He shares with me some of his God moments now. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, with his kids, that blesses me. And I'm able to affirm and say, that's what it's about, Luke. That's what it's about. Making those tensions into God moments. And so for sibling rivalry when kids are younger, it's working together. It's playing together with good attitudes. It's serving one another, taking joy. And frankly, until they get the attitude right, they're not learned it. Do you know what I mean? So for me. Yeah. Chores at home, packing the dishwasher. I mean, you can tell when a child packs the dishwasher whether they're happy about packing the dishwasher <laughs> or whether they are really resenting this chore. Yeah. You know, the banging, the clanging, the whatever, you know, the job being done, was it done properly, whatever. Well, I would just calmly go up and say, you know what, I'm telling that you're not really feeling it tonight, so I think you need more practice. You'll be on the dishwasher duty tomorrow as well. Two or three days of that. They learn to modify their attitude. And if they don't, if they don't, you just wash the clothes in the bathtub tomorrow night. That's it. You (laughs) want to get back to it. You know what? You're having a struggle to serving the family here. So I think you need to get the vacuum cleaner out and vacuum the house, this floor, whatever. 
it's it's adding to it. Get your attitude right. You, but I did the job properly. It's not about the job being done properly. It's about the attitude. Do you know? Do you get what I'm meaning? Yeah. It's I'm, not yeah. about just completing the work. If you've got a bad attitude in how you're doing it, then you haven't got it right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing the beauty. My husband, my husband's older than me by five years, so he's seventy-two. He says to you young bucks like you, Josh, oh, I wish I had your youth. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't want to go back at all. Like, to be <laughs> back where you guys are, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know what what people, God people you're creating, you know, you're, you're you know, yes. uh, like forming there uh, or, or leading. Um, I can look back now and I can see the fruit of my labour. When Luke comes and tells me about the God moment he has with his kids, yeah. I can say, you got it. You know what it's about now. You, you, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about them getting on with each other, yeah, they still have their tensions. And sometimes we've, when they were younger, we would rock up at a Rebecca event and uh, we would be there. The boys might get there at like 10 or 11 in the morning and David and I wouldn't get there until, um, I don't know, 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And we'd have loaders from the church come out and say, oh, so you guys must be the parents. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, gosh, you can tell they're brothers with the way they talk to one another. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think you are like, about some of that now. And they've had to work through a lot of, uh, a lot yeah. of that stuff. So, yeah, they still tick each other off. But you know what? It's the difference between like and love too. Yeah. There's a lot of... Some days they may not like one another. Some days they might be a bit angry with one another. But the love is there. The yeah. love is strong. And the love is what binds uh, people together. And giving grace. I mean, in a marriage, you've got to give grace to one another. Oh, you can say that. The like-love thing is is between us. I mean, there's days yeah. that like each yeah. other. Yeah. Give grace. I mean, if yeah. one of you has a bad habit of getting up from the, the, the lunch table and leaving all your dishes there because they've, They've moved on to the next thing. That's my husband. They've moved on to the next thing. And I look there and think, oh, so I suppose I'm clearing the table. Yeah. Well, he's he. if I asked him, he'd come back and do it. He just didn't even see it anymore. You know what I mean? And it's giving grace to say, well, I have two choices here. I can do it myself. Or I could say, hey, David, did you realise you left all the dishes on the table? I choose to give grace. I mean, mm. life's too short. I'm not going to get on everybody's back and be a nag and a pain. That's a word right there. That's a good one. Yeah. So, that's that's what family, and that's why God puts us in oh. marriage. It's why God puts us in families because we have so many rough edges oh, that yeah. just need to be chipped away. So yeah. And and this strong love bond is a very safe place to help create, I mean, lead us to shape us into being more like Christ, into being holy. Mm. So good. For those of you guys listening and, you know, you've listened and been blessed uh, by Rebecca St. James's music or, you know, for King and Country, and you've been blessed by this family from, from that side of it, I hope today you've got a little bit of an, of an insight that this really started by being famous at home and that the state, <laughs> I mean, truly, I mean, this is, this is you, Helen. And, and, and I mean, it's why the boys wrote Unsung Hero for you. Uh, I oh, we just, didn't even get to talk about that. Yeah, the 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 the, the oh, the 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 song and 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 just knowing the way they honor you and the way that you're honored and and I think it it just speaks to to who you are and the way that you've done this and um guys go I feel like we're ending this conversation there's so many more stories to be had and so much more wisdom to pull from you this is why we want you to go get the book behind the lights the extraordinary adventure of a mum and her family, with Christy being from Canada, mum, uh, I know is very endearing because our kids use mum as well. And so- uh, we're, we're not normal here. So I love to hear it from another family too. And, and you have and you have uh, mums, uh, the, the mum community, right? Uh, mum life, mothers, uplifting mothers. And uh, so make sure we'll put this in the show notes as well. You can check that out. Helen, would you just speak to that uh, just for a few minutes, just so those listening can find uh, what you're doing as well in your community? Thank you. Um, yeah, about 10 years ago, um, I was asked to be a mental mum, and I'm a big into mentoring because it's so hard to do things on, on our own. 
I was very fortunate that I had a wonderful mum and a wonderful mother-in-law who really showed me what it was like to be a wife and a mum. Um, and uh, so these days, mentoring, a lot of us don't have those role models in our family. Mentoring has become a big thing for me. Um, so I, I, I've become involved with an organisation called Mum Life, uh, sorry, Mum Life Community. And uh, we've been, uh, the last, I think, two or three years, we've been able to do podcasts with Access More. And so they're Mum Life Community podcasts. They're like sitting at a table with eight women, eight younger mums, and I'm, of course, <laughs> the senior mum, and it's just sharing life on different subject matters. And it's very real, very honest communication. Um, we deal with marriage, sex, uh, discipline, uh, parenting, you name it, the gamut of what it means to be a mum, uh, we're, we're talking about it and we're talking about it honestly and vulnerably. Uh, if you're a mum and you need a mentor, Helen is here for you. And so uh -huh. we're going to put it in the show notes. Please make sure you check that out as well. Helen, thank you so much for your time today. It means so much to us. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Christy. It was such a gift, Helen, truly. Thank you. Until next week, keep in mind that the greatest red carpet you will ever walk is through your front door. Keep being famous at home.